What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back with another installment of our Beyond Omega Level series where we break down the most powerful characters in comics. And you know, sometimes I look at the characters we've covered and I'll just be shocked when I notice characters that I can't believe we haven't covered already. And that happened this week when I noticed that we never covered Dr. Manhattan in Beyond Omega Level. So we need to change that. So Dr. Manhattan was created by Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons and first appeared in Watchmen number one in 1986. Now like the rest of the Watchmen characters, Dr. Manhattan was based on a character from Charlton Comics. In this case, Dr. Manhattan was based in part on Captain Adam, a character who would later make his way to DC Comics along with several other Charlton characters and a character we have covered covered on Beyond Omega Level before if you want to check that out. Now ultimately, both Moore and DC Editorial decided it'd be better to use original characters instead of Charlton characters, and so the Watchmen were born. Now, Dr. Manhattan's real name is John Osterman, who was born in 1929, and whose father was a watchmaker, which is also what John plans to become. But when the US drops the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Japan at the end of World War II, John's father pushes him towards a career in nuclear physics, and so John gets a PhD from Princeton and begins a career in nuclear physics where he meets a woman named Janie Slater, who he basically falls in love with. Now, one fateful day, John ends up leaving his watch inside the test chamber of an experiment that he's working on and goes back in to get it. John's locked in the chamber and the experiment engages, which results in John seemingly being disintegrated. Now, over the next few months, however, John's body reforms itself and eventually he reappears fully intact, but looking quite different with a glowing blue body and a set of superpowers. Now, one of the questions you guys are probably asking here is Rob. How does a person learn things like, like nuclear physics? How does a person become that smart? Well, I'll tell you exactly how, you know, it's been a little while. It's been a little while. And I know you guys know it's coming. The way you learn stuff like that is using Skillshare. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this video is sponsored by Skillshare. Now, I'm not aware of any classes that'll teach you how to become a nuclear physicist, but I am aware of a class by a guy named Nathaniel Drew, <laughs> which is called How to Speak Confidently on Camera, a guide for content creators. And this is one that was really, really impactful for me. I mean, it's one of those things to kind of keep in mind that as a content creator, your skills are ever changing and ever learning, and you're constantly progressing. And there are times when those skills become a little bit rusty. And a lot of you all are also looking to become content creators yourself. This course in particular was great because I know that public speaking is like the number one fear of virtually everybody in the world, but it's also learning how to become confident when you talk on camera. It is a little weird at first. You're literally talking to a machine that's recording your face and your voice, and it's not an actual person. What this course does is teach you how to engage with the camera as if you're talking to a person so that when you're someone like me and you're just in front of a microphone or in front of a camera that you can speak with confidence and you don't sound kind of like, I mean, hey, what's going on, guys? My name's Rob, and you don't sound unsure of yourself. So the first 1,000 of my viewers to sign up through my link in the description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare so that you can start exploring your creativity today. So make sure you guys check the link in the description. Having said that, let's get back into our video on Dr. Manhattan. So. After that crazy experiment that turned John into Dr. Manhattan, he goes and works for the US government and he actually starts calling himself Dr. Manhattan, which is a nod to the Manhattan Project, which developed the first atomic bomb. But Dr. Manhattan proves to be invaluable to the US during the Cold War and his presence in Vietnam gives the Americans a swift victory in the conflict as opposed to the real world where we basically just went running with our tail between our legs. But he's also responsible for multiple technological advances, including allowing the US to transition from gas powered engines to electric. However, other countries see Dr. Manhattan as a threat and begin to build up their nuclear arsenals in response. Now, Dr. Manhattan would also join the group known as the Crime Busters, a group of costumed heroes, including Lori Jaspezic, the Silk Spectre, who Dr. Manhattan ends up dating. Now, after allegations that exposure to Dr. Manhattan caused former friends and co-workers, including his ex-girlfriend Janie, to basically develop cancer, John leaves Earth and goes to Mars. Now, there's other reasons for that too, because basically John is just tired of humanity and is ready to just leave the Earth and go somewhere else. He is very much, he's very misanthropic in that way when you think about it. But the Soviet Union capitalizes on his absence and invades Afghanistan, which brings the Earth to the brink of nuclear war, which threatens the existence of mankind. Now, initially, he has no interest in helping mankind because he sees the end of humanity as just a really, really good thing. But Silk Spectre convinces him to return to Earth where he finds out the whole cancer thing was a lie made up by his former teammate Ozymandias, who has become
become a revered public figure, but who has killed a lot of people to try to avoid World War III, which he successfully does. And honestly, I can't say that it was a bad thing. I mean, sure, is it sad, but it's time for another episode of Yes, But Maybe. Yes, yes, it's sad that he killed a lot of people. Yes, it's sad those people died, but maybe, <laughs> maybe it was worth it to avoid a third world war that would have involved the end of mankind. So having said that, <laughs> rather than punish Ozymandias for killing half of New York City, Dr. Manhattan vaporizes another former teammate, Rorschach, who threatens to reveal the truth about Ozymandias because Manhattan believes revealing the truth would actually lead to more conflict. Following this, Dr. Manhattan leaves Earth to find a less complicated, like, galaxy or universe or what have you, and that was the last time we ever saw him, or it would be, if Alan Moore had gotten his way. But we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, first we need to go over Dr. Manhattan's powers, and the thing that makes him so powerful is his ability to manipulate matter at a subatomic level, which effectively means that he can do anything he wants. He can alter his size to massive heights and can create a seemingly limitless number of copies of himself, each of which can function independently of one another at the same time. So he can be pretty much everywhere at once. He can teleport himself and others at will, possesses telekinesis, and as we alluded to earlier, can disintegrate others with a mere thought. Although he is not technically omniscient, he is able to perceive his own past, present, and future simultaneously. Now, Dr. Manhattan has made the claim that he can sense tachyons, which are hypothetical particles that move faster than the speed of light, and he has hypothesized that he has the ability to create human life should he desire to do that. Now, as I said earlier, if Alan Moore had his way, we would never have seen Dr. Manhattan again after the events of the 12-issue Watchmen series, but because of the terms of his contract with DC, they actually own the characters and can use them in other books if they want. Now, for over 25 years, years, DC honored Alan Moore's wishes and didn't publish any books using the Watchmen characters, but that changed in 2012, when they released a series of prequel comics called Before Watchmen, which explained the origins of most of the characters, and we've already talked about the stuff that it added to Dr. Manhattan's origin. While Before Watchmen was controversial since Alan Moore had nothing to do with writing the stories, and when I say controversial, I mean there were some grumblings, in 2016, DC made the even more controversial decision, which again, more grumblings, to bring the Watchmen characters characters into the main DC universe with their rebirth initiative. This should come as no surprise to anybody with DC doing this because as DC has routinely brought characters from other universes into the DC universe proper. Now they brought in Charlton characters that we talked about earlier and after they merged the Vertigo, Wildstorm, and Milestone universes with the DC universe as well, it was only a matter of time before they did the same with the Watchmen. And that's important to our discussion of Dr. Manhattan because the introduction of the Watchmen into the DC universe was really just a way to to see Dr. Manhattan fight DC superheroes. So what we find out is that it was actually Dr. Manhattan that was responsible for the reboot of the DC universe that occurred with the launch of the new 52. When he became aware of the DC universe, Dr. Manhattan tried to correct the DC timeline to avoid a potential third world war. So he orchestrated the Flashpoint event that would see Barry Allen merge the DC, Wildstorm, and Vertigo universes and reboot the entire DC universe. Now, Dr. Manhattan was also responsible for trapping Wally West in the Speed Force, along with several other Flash characters that have been seemingly erased from existence in the new 52 relaunch. But Manhattan alters the DC universe in other ways as well, like setting up a meeting between Bruce Wayne and his father Thomas Wayne from the Flashpoint universe and saving Jor-El from death following the destruction of the planet Krypton. Now, both of these were attempts to try and get the fathers of DC's two most prominent heroes to convince their sons to give up the mantles and stop saving people, but neither of them worked. We also end up hearing from some really powerful DC characters that have encountered Dr. Manhattan and relate how powerful he is, such as the reverse Flash Eobard Thawne, who likens Manhattan to God, which was just an amazing moment, just in the button. You guys remember that? Like when Flashpoint like takes off, like he, I think he, what is he, he grabs a button or whatever it is, he ends up taking off, he encounters Dr. Manhattan off, off like off panel, he comes back and he's like, God, I saw God, and then just disintegrates, just dies and it's just like wow like when that story came out it was mind-blowing when it happened of course the same thing also happens with mr mixel who is it's mr mixel Pitalik. i just don't feel like pronouncing his name because it's just more of a pain in the ass than it's worth but he's an extremely powerful reality warper in his own right and admits that his power pales in comparison to that of dr manhattan now everything comes to a head during the doomsday clock event which is where we finally get to see dr manhattan take on the dc universe and i'm not even going to begin to explain the 
events of Doomsday Clock here because that would take forever. And I've already covered it in a series of videos that you can just go back and watch. But one of the big moments is when almost every superhero in the DC universe, minus Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, confront Dr. Manhattan on Mars. And this group includes Martian Manhunter, multiple Green Lanterns, Captain Adam, the Flash, Shazam, just a ton of heavy hitters. And they're all utterly powerless to do anything to Dr. Manhattan. Even when Captain Adam seemingly vaporizes Manhattan, he reappears seconds later and then incapacitates the whole group. Now, unfortunately, we don't get a showdown between Dr. Manhattan and Superman because Manhattan observes Superman's heroism and is inspired to undo a lot of the changes that he made in reality in creating the new 52 universe before returning to his home universe and giving his Earth all his energy in order to restore it, erasing himself from existence in the process. You heard that right, ladies and gentlemen. The entirety of Doomsday Clock was, well, hopefully, I, I, I don't remember if Jeff John said that Superman and Dr. Manhattan were going to fight. I think he said they weren't, but I think as the fan base, we just decided they would, and then we just got mad when they didn't, <laughs> even though we were told they wouldn't. But I really did want to see a fight between Dr. Manhattan and Superman, even though I know full well Superman wouldn't win, it still would have been cool. But now that we've covered Dr. Manhattan, and honestly, we couldn't have a list of beyond Omega level characters that didn't include him, we now have the role he played in the creation of the DC Universe as we know it. But let me know what you guys think. Why did you enjoy seeing Dr. Manhattan in the DC Universe, or should DC have just left him alone, like Alan Moore wanted? As always, make sure you guys leave a comment down below with characters that you want to see, and I will catch you all later. Peace.